Malgudi Days by R K Narayan. Today's story is Ishwaran. Before getting into the story, requesting all the viewers to subscribe and share your support. When the whole of the student world in Malgudi was convulsed with excitement on a certain evening in June, when the intermediate examination results were expected, Ishwaran went about his business looking very unconcerned and detached. he had earned the reputation of having aged in the intermediate class he entered the intermediate class in albert mission college as a youngster with fan down on his upper lip now he was still there his figure had grown brawny and athletic and his chin had become tanned and leathery some people even said that you could see gray hairs on his head the first time he failed his parents sympathized with him the second time also he managed to get their sympathies but subsequently they grew more critical and unsparing and after repeated failures they lost all interest in his examination he was often told by his parents why don't you discontinue your studies and try to do something useful he always pleaded let me have this one last chance He clung to the university education with a ferocious devotion and now the whole town was agog with the expectation of results in the evening boys moved about the street in groups and on the sands of sarayu they sat in clusters nervously smiling and biting their fingernails others hung about the gates of the senate house staring anxiously at the walls behind which a meeting was going on as much as the boys if not more the parents were agitated except ashwarans who when they heard their neighbors discussing their sons possible future results remarked with a sigh no such worry for ishwaran his results are famous and known to everyone in advance ishwaran said fishesly i have perhaps passed this time for the who knows i did study quite hard You are the greatest optimist in India at the moment but for this obstinate hope you would never have appeared for the same examination every year I failed only in logic very narrowly last year he defended himself at which the whole family laughed in any case why don't you go and wait along with other boys and look up your results his mother asked not at all necessary ishwaran replied If I pass they will bring home the news do you think i saw my results last year i spent my time in a cinema i sat through two shows consecutively he hummed as he went in for a wash before dressing to go out he combed his hair with deliberate care the more so because he knew everybody looked on him as a sort of an outcast for failing so often He knew that behind him the whole family and the town were laughing he felt that they remarked among themselves that washing combing his hair and putting on a well ironed coat were luxuries too far above his state he was a failure and had no right to such luxuries he was treated as a sort of thick skinned idiot but he did not care he answered their attitude by behaving like a desperado he swung his arms stood up and down bragged and shouted and went to a cinema but all this was only a mask under it was a creature hopelessly seared by failure desperately longing and praying for success on the day of the results he was inwardly in a trembling suspense mother he said as he went out don't expect me for dinner tonight i will eat something in a hotel and sit through both shows at the palace takis emerging from vinayak street he saw a group of boys moving up the market road towards the college someone asked ishwaran coming up to see the results yes yes presently but now i have to be going on an urgent business where palace takis At this all the boys laughed you seem to know your results already do you i do 
otherwise do you think i would be celebrating it with a picture what is your number 785 he said giving the first set of numbers that came to his head the group passed on joking we know you are going to get a first class this time he sat in a far off corner in the four anna class he looked about not a single student in the whole theater all the students of the town were near the senate house waiting for the results ishwaran felt very unhappy to be the only student in the whole theater somehow fate seemed to have isolated him from his fellow beings in every respect he felt very depressed and unhappy he felt an utter distance for himself soon the lights went out and the show started a tamil film with all the known gods in it he soon lost himself in the politics and struggles of gods and goddesses he sat wrapped in the vision of a heavenly world which some film director had chosen to present this felicity of forgetfulness lasted but half an hour soon the heroine of the story sat on a low branch of a tree in paradise and wouldn't move out of the place she sat there singing a song for over half an hour this portion tired ishwaran and now there returned all the old pains and gloom oh lady ishwaran appealed don't add to my troubles please move on as if she heard this appeal the lady moved off and brighter things followed a battle a deluge somebody dropping headlong from cloudland and somebody coming up from the bed of an ocean a rain of fire a rain of flowers people dying people rising from graves and so on all kinds of thrills occurred on that white screen beyond the pall of tobacco smoke the continuous babble on and off the screen music and shouting the cry of peddlers selling soda the unstrained comments of the spectators all this din and commotion helped ishwaran to forget the senate house and the student life for a few hours the show ended at 10 o'clock in the night the crowd was waiting at the gate for the night show ishwaran walked across to anand bhavan a restaurant opposite the palace talkies the proprietor a genial bombay man was a friend of his and cried ishwar sahab the results were announced today what about yours i did not write any examination this year ishwaran said why why i thought you paid your examination fees ishwaran laughed you are right i have passed my intermediate just this evening Ah how very good how clever you must be if you pray to hanuman he will always bring you success what are you going to do next i will go to a higher class that is all ishwaran said he ordered a few tidbits and coffee and rose to go as he paid his bill and walked out the hotel proprietor said don't leave me out when you are giving a dinner to celebrate your success Ishwaran again purchased a ticket and went back to the picture. Once more, all strives and struggles and intrigues of gods were repeated before him. He was once again lost in it. When he saw on the screen some young men of his age singing as they sported in the waters of some distant heaven, he said, "Well, might you do it, boys?" I suppose you have no examination where you are and he was seized with a longing to belong to that world now the leading lady sat on the low branch of a tree and started singing and ishwaran lost interest in the picture he looked about for the first time he noticed in the semi darkness several groups of boys in the hall happy groups he knew that they must all have seen their results and come now to celebrate their success there were at least 50 he knew that they must be a happy and gay lot with their lips red from chewing betel leaves 
He knew that all of them would focus their attention on him the moment lights went up. They would all rag him about his results, all the old tedious joking over again, and all the tiresome pose of a desperado. He felt thoroughly sick of the whole business. He would not stand any more of it. The mirthful faces of these men of success and their leaders. He was certain they would all look on him with the feeling that he had no business to seek the pleasure of a picture on that day. He moved on to a more obscure corner of the hall. He looked at the screen. Nothing dared to cheer him. The leading lady was still there and he knew she would certainly stay there for next 20 minutes singing her masterpiece. He was overcome with dejection. He rose silently, edged towards the exit and was out of the theatre in a moment. He felt a loathing for himself after seeing those successful boys. I'm not fit to live, a fellow who cannot pass an examination. This idea developed in his mind, a glorious solution to all difficulties, die and go to a world where there were young men free from examination who sported in lotus pools in paradise. No bothers, no disgusting senate house wall to gaze on hopelessly year after year. This solution suddenly brought him a feeling of relief. He felt lighter. He walked across to the hotel. The hotel man was about to rise and go to bed. Sergi, Ishwaran said, please forgive my troubling you now. Give me a piece of paper and pencil. I have to note down something urgently. So late as this, said the hotel man, and gave him a slip of paper and a pencil step. Ishwaran wrote down a message for his father, folded the slip and placed it carefully in the inner pocket of his coat. He returned the pencil and stepped out of the hotel. He had only the stretch of the race course road and, turning to his right, half the market road to Traverse and then Alaman Street and then Sereyu. Its dark swirling waters would close on him and end all his miseries. I must leave this letter in my coat pocket and remember to leave my coat on the river step. He told himself. He was soon out of Alaman Street. His feet plogged through the sands of the river bank. He came to the river steps, removed his coat briskly and went down the steps. Oh God, he muttered with folded hands, looking up at his stars. If I can't pass an examination even with a tenth attempt, what is the use of my living and disgracing the world? His feet were in water. He looked over his shoulder at the cluster of university buildings. There was a light burning on the porch of the Senate house. It was nearing midnight. It was a quarter of an hour's walk. Why not walk across and take a last look at the results board? In any case, he was going to die. And why should he shrink and tremble before the boat? He came out of the water and went up the steps, leaving his coat behind and he walked across the sand. Somewhere a time gong struck twelve. Stars sparkled overhead. The river flowed on with a murmur and miscellaneous night sounds emanated from the bushes on the bank. A cold wind blew on his wet, sand-covered feet. He entered the senate porch with a defiant heart. I am in no fear of anything here, he muttered. The senate house was deserted not a sound anywhere. The whole building was in darkness except the staircase landing where a large bulb was burning and notice boards hung on the wall. His heart palpitated as he stood tiptoe to scan the results. By the light of the bulb, he scrutinized the numbers. His throat went dry. He looked through the numbers of people who had passed in third class. His own number was 501. The successful number before him was 498 and after that 703. So, I have few friends on either side, 
he said with a forced mirth. He had a wild hope as he approached the Senate House that somehow his number would have found a place in the list of successful candidates. He had speculated how he should feel after that. He would rush home and demand that they take back all their commands with apologies. But now, after he gazed at the notice board for quite a while, the grim reality of his failure dawned on him. His number was nowhere. The river, he said. He felt desolate like a condemned man who had a sudden but false promise of reprieve. The river, Ishwaran muttered, I am going. He told the notice board and moved a few steps. I haven't seen how many have obtained honours. He looked at the notice board once again. He gazed at the top columns of the results. First classes, curiously enough, a fellow with number one secured a first class and six others. Good fellows, wonder how they managed it, he said with admiration. His eyes travelled down to second classes. It was in two lines, starting with 98. There were about 15. He looked fixedly at each number before going on to the next. He came to 350, after that 400, and after that 501 and then 600. 501 in second class? Can it be true? He shrieked. He looked at the number again and again. Yes, there it was. He had obtained a second class. If this is true, I shall sit in the BA class next month, he shouted. His voice rang through the silent building. I will flay alive anyone who calls me a fool hereafter, he proclaimed. He felt slightly giddy. He leant against the wall. Years of strain and suspense were suddenly relaxed, and he could hardly bear the force of this release. Blood raced along his veins and heaved and knocked under his skull. He steadied himself with an effort. He softly hummed a tune to himself. He felt he was the sole occupant of the world and its overlord. He thumped his chest and addressed the notice board. No, who I am? He stroked an imaginary moustache arrogantly, laughed to himself and asked, is the horse ready, groom? He threw a supercilious side glance at the notice board and strutted out like a king. He stood on the last step of the porch and looked for his steed. He waited for a minute and commanded, Fool, bring the horse nearer. Do you hear? The horse was brought nearer. He made a movement as if mourning and whipped his horse into a furry. His voice rang through the dark riverside, urging the horse on. He swung his arms and ran along the sands. He shouted at the top of his voice, Keep off, the king is coming. Whoever comes his way will be trampled. I have five hundred and one horses. He spoke to the knight. The number stuck in his mind and kept coming up again and again. He ran the whole length of the river bank up and down. Somehow this did not satisfy him. Prime Minister, he said, This horse no good. Bring me the other 501 horses. They are all in second classes. He gave a kick to the horse which he had been riding and drove it off. Very soon the Prime Minister brought him another horse. He mounted it with dignity and said, This is better. Now he galloped about on his horse. It was a strange sight. In the dim starlight, alone at that hour, making a tap-tap with his tongue to imitate galloping hoofs. With one hand swinging and tugging the reins and with the other stroking his moustache defiantly. He urged the horse on and on until it attained the speed of his storm. He felt like a conqueror as the air rushed about him. Soon he crossed the whole stretch of sand. He came to the water's edge, hesitated for a moment and whispered to his horse, 
or you afraid of water you must swim across otherwise i will never pay 5 not 1 rupees for you he felt the horse make a leap next afternoon his body came up at a spot about a quarter of a mile down the course of the river meanwhile some persons had already picked up the coat left on the step and discovered in the inner pocket the slip of paper with the inscription my dear father by the time you see this letter i shall be at the bottom of sarayu i don't want to live don't worry about me you have other sons who are not such dunces as i am analysis and outcome from the story above story has theme of failure desire aspirations self doubt fear and control in fact ishwaran was fighting both with his inner self and with society according to the norms that designate a person a total failure who cannot pass the exams the moment he learned the results he became overjoyed but in his mind he became devastated this damaged his self esteem his hope for future was gone the suicide note was already written in his mind the death had already won despite passing the exam he failed the mental test it is ishwaran the boy that we know one should uplift their confidence and each person in society has their responsibility towards people hope you understand the author's view and the story as well please subscribe and share your support